This morning's reading is taken from Psalm chapter 46, verses 1 to 11. Psalm 46, 1 to 11. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Good morning, church. Begin with a word of prayer. God, uh, we give thanks to you for this day. We're grateful for the fact that we were able to partake of the Lord's Supper. And now we're grateful for this time that we're able to get into the Word of God and allow it to speak to our hearts and our souls this morning. And Lord, as we do this, I pray that we'll have open hearts and that we'll receive the Word that's put out there. Be with us now, Lord, as we focus in on your words, we pray through Jesus' name. Amen. So the date was January 1st, 1863. To many of us here, it's a date that causes us to think of New Year's Day. But no, I'm not wanting your minds to go there this morning. Instead, I bring you to a time where millions of African Americans were set free by a presidential proclamation and executive order issued by Abraham Lincoln. That proclamation was known as the Emancipation Proclamation. Imagine an order given that meant you could be free from the abusive tyranny of slave owners. No more brutality. No more beatings. No more whips across your back for not meeting cotton-picking quotas. It was a law that was passed that said if you escape the control of your master, by running away you could be legally free. The surprising thing is that many never ran. They had an opportunity for freedom, but they never took it. Many did run. And they were given the title, Freed Men. Yes, yes, imagine that title, that title, Freed Men. But they continued to live as though they were still slaves. You know, Jesus tells us some profound words in the Bible that should be even more freeing than the words that were spoken by Abraham Lincoln. He said, I came so that you would have life and have it more abundantly. He said, you shall know the truth, and that knowledge of that truth would set you free. He makes these great statements, and many in the church accept them, but choose to live as individuals that aren't free. They carry the title Christian, but mentally, they're still in shackles. So I want to suggest this morning that Christians who choose to live as though they are not freed from, uh, freed from, uh, from the life of, 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 of slavery are still in a state of what I'm calling spiritual slavery. So in this world, people join the family of God through faith, repentance, and baptism. They receive God's Spirit or God's gift of the Holy Spirit. But even with that great gift, Choose to live lives that are not free. 
So as a result, their lives show very little evidence that God is present and at work. But thank God for the writings of the Apostle Paul, who wrote to the church in Philippi way back in the middle of the first century. We learn from the historical account in Acts that Paul was responsible for starting a church in that city. And after planting that church, he stayed with the new members for some time. And as you read Philippians, it's hard to miss the fact that Paul had formed really, really strong relationships with the members in that church. Their love for him was so great that when they got word that their founder had been imprisoned, they sent one of their members on a 100-mile or possibly a thousand mile journey, depending on where you believe Paul was imprisoned. As I was working on this, it dawned on me that that distance was equivalent to four marathons, or as many as 40 marathons one way. Forget the simplicity of emailing, texting, and Skype, and those other methods we can quickly get in contact with people with. Imagine all that walking just to check on him and to bring him some gifts. So when he arrived to where Paul was, a letter from Paul's heart was given back to him to take back to the church that he had planted. And it is believed that that letter was read aloud to the entire church. And when I read Paul's letter, I get the sense that he wrote to help them break free from spiritual slavery. Paul thought that, uh, taught them to live as free people, to not fear death, to not view his situation as something that was bad. But it was hard for them to live that way because of where, their new, where they knew their founder was. Their founder was miles away, locked up and in chains. There is an emotion that overtakes us in moments of transition, isn't there? In moments of testing, in moments of impending crisis. It's what the word that Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brings up. It's the word anxiety. The wisest man in the Bible observed that people with anxiety have minds that cannot rest. Anxiety, when you think about it, can paralyze a person. It can cause people to forget how to relate to other people. It can cause us to forget our strengths and to focus on our weaknesses. It can cause us to procrastinate. And it can push us to the brink of taking easy ways out. And for many, it pushes them even to the point where they want to check out of life and take their own lives. It can cause us to forget important principles that you'd normally live by. Some of you have been given keys to the building. Yes, to this building. You've experienced anxiety's effects. You know when you step into our building as in that peaceful state, you unlock that door, then you realize there's a point of no return. Your action has told the alarm that you entered the building. There's that beep. That, that beep that just keeps on going. It gets faster and faster and louder and louder, indicating to you that if you don't do something, that alarm is going to go off. So you try the pin pad. As Wayne and I instructed, we gave you the code. You think you followed the instructions. Then you realize that the red light still is on and it's still beeping. Now you try everything. You try pressing the buttons harder. You try pausing to rethink what you were told. And now you've got the alarm going. Your blood pressure's up. Then the phone rings. And you know who it is. It's the alarm company. You reach for the door to the library and guess what? It's locked. Now you've got two bells ringing that you can't do anything about. Can you feel that? 
Have you been there? Sean, you better learn that code. <laughs> it's like Mr. Anxiety knocks on your door, and when you answer, he takes over. That's anxiety, and if you're human, you are susceptible to it. And at a time like this where we are a few days from starting school, as our kids, our youth, and our college students begin school, I'm guessing your anxiety meter is running pretty high right now. And parents, think about, think about the, you're thinking about your kids and all the things that come along with them starting back at school, considering the cost of all their clothes, their books, haircuts, gym shoes, extracurricular expenses, wondering if they'll fit in at their new schools, how they'll handle this and that. And that's just scraping the surface, isn't it? Anxiety always has a trigger, doesn't it? There's a knock that gets our attention. The trigger is something that comes before the actual anxiety fully takes over. For some, that trigger is the word church. That word causes their anxiety levels to go through the roof. You go through life for six of the seven days of the week, and it's smooth sailing. Then when Sunday hits, anxiety takes over. It's potluck. <gasps> it's VBS week. It's youth rally. Men's breakfast. For some, their trigger is the thought of entering your office at work. The thought of stepping into the high-stress environment of the office. I can see why that would cause anxiety. It's where many of us spend most of our time. It's at the office for many where a shift occurs where you go from being Mr. Peace to Mr. Anxiety. Maybe for you, your trigger for anxiety is the thought of being in your own home. I read the other day about a mother who, should, who would sit in her car on her driveway for hours because she thought of all the responsibilities that went along with her being a mother. I don't know about you this morning, but for me, I desire to be a flute. But oftentimes I'm wound up like the strings on a guitar. Or maybe it's the thought of retirement. In that place, I'm aging and I'm going to so many funerals as time rolls on, I could be next. So that consumes all my thoughts and robs me of the joy that we should have as Christians. So prior to becoming Christians and to having knowledge of God, His power and His Word, I'd say it's understandable why we'd be so hospitable to Mr. Anxiety when he comes knocking on our door. Mr. Anxiety recently knocked on my door when I was given the opportunity to sing the national anthem at the Gold Eyes game back in July. Two hours before the game, I was supposed to meet the director of sales and marketing at the security table, where he escorted me down the tunnel to the place where I was uh, to enter to go to the field for the rehearsal. And uh, he handed me the mic. He told me, walk out to the diamond, uh, just to the right of the batting diamond there, the home plate. And so I did it. I let, uh, and, and for one moment, I let Mr. Anxiety in. An hour later, I was to meet him back there. Except now, uh, there was a crack in, in, in my door, and, and, and he almost took over the whole house. The stands filled up. I turned behind me. I forgot who I was. It was like in that moment I teetered between knowing who I was in Christ and feeling like I was totally out of my league. Heading to the ball game, I was singing with excitement. Take me out to the ball game. I could identify, uh, but then later, shortly after, when it was time for me to sing, I was saying, take me out of the ball game. See, I could identify with Solomon when he wrote in Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety weighs down the heart. You know, it's interesting to think of what the biblical word for anxiety is. In the Greek, it's merimentao. It's a compound of two Greek words. Merizo, to divide. 
and noose the mind. So I guess you could say then, to be in the state where anxiety rules, we choose to live half-mindedly. I can see why God would inspire Paul to write about this topic. If I'm to love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, how can I do that when I've allowed something called anxiety to come and rule in my heart? So with all that in mind, can you turn with me to the freeing section of Scripture? The freeing section of Scripture in your Bibles, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. You probably heard the passage a lot, but today I want you to read it slowly. It's up on the screen, I believe. Here it is there. If you don't have your Bible, you can just look up on the screen. But listen to what Paul says. Uh, it's, it's, we're starting in verse 4, so uh, sorry if this doesn't pick up with that. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I believe these verses God puts before us are like bolt cutters. I was chained to the chair before, but now that I have knowledge of this passage, there can be hope. We have to realize that God provides us, or provides the cutters, but we must be willing to clamp down. We must be willing to put into practice what He says. We must be doers and not just hearers, as James says. If we are willing, God promises to set us free from anxiety. So let's break this down into some smaller parts. Starting in verse 4, if you have your Bible, keep on looking there. The Bible says, or Paul lays out for us the mindset that we should have in life. He says, rejoice in the Lord. When? Always. You read it and you think that Paul has a stuttering problem. Because his prescription is there twice. Two times he tells them. To rejoice. Notice it says, in the Lord. We can choose to have a rejoicing attitude because we know where we reside. If we are Christians, we are in the Lord. So I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. And as Christian people, we are in the Lord. Are you in the Lord? It's a good question to be asking. That's a concept Paul really loves. When you read his writings, you'll notice one of his favorite phrases as he speaks to Christians is in Christ. He wants us to realize that. Young people know this so well. When we sing the song, with Jesus in my boat, I can smile at the storm. Right? You know that song. We can smile at the storm. Why? Because we know whose boat we're in. Because we're in that boat. Paul encourages us, to see, encourages us to see life from a different perspective. When you come to Christ through faith, repentance, and baptism, experience God's amazing grace, He opens up the door, lets you and me in. He gives me an opportunity to fly with Him. And boy, does He ever know how to fly the plane. He's got a perfect flight record, you know. We actually had a situation happen to us when our plane almost went down. You know how Kim and I go to Dominica to be with my mom and dad uh, every year. Uh, we were flying uh, over an island, uh, and I said to Kim, Honey, I think we passed that island before. And she said, Uh-uh, no we didn't. So we went around the island again. And I said, Honey, that's that same place. It's the same island. No. And then at that moment, the pilot came on and he said, 
we are having problems with the flight. And we said, everybody gasped. And he said, the problem is our landing gear is stuck down. And we're not sure. Uh, actually, he said, the, the, the indicator is indicating to us that our landing gear may be broken. Well, I saw people grip the front of their seat. I heard people say, we're going to die. Right? And I said to Kim, honey, it's been a great, I think it was 10 years. I love you. And I said, but if we die, you know where we're going, right? And just that thought brought me and it brought Kim peace. We didn't have to grip on to the edges of the seat, of the chair, to the handles, because we knew what would happen if we died. So Paul gives further instruction. Paul gives further instructions in verse 6. I'm not sure if you've really thought much about what he's telling Christians here. What he's asking Christians to do here seems like an impossibility. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Anything. And just thinking about be anxious. As I meditated on this verse, it dawned on me that on our way... Uh, that, uh, that on our own strength, living out this command would be impossible. But let us not forget that we are in relationship with the one who said, with God, all things are possible. That includes living an anxious, free life. So the way you become a person who lives out Paul's request to be anxious for nothing is by following his instructions stated right here after the Did you see it? Prayer. In everything, prayer. So as Christian people, prayer is supposed to be our defense against the perpetual knocks that come from Mr. Anxiety. And just as someone with a severe allergy has an EpiPen to reach for in times when they come in contact with an allergen, Christians have their spiritual EpiPen. It's a gift, and it's called prayer. It's an EpiPen because after using it, it gives us strength to keep the door shut while Mr. Anxiety comes a-knocking. I see him coming through the peephole, and instead of reaching for the doorknob and saying, Come on in, Mr. Anxiety, I recognize when he's coming and I drop to my knees for a little talk with Jesus. Prayer. Addressing God. If you want to be a person who is free from anxiety, being willing to address God directly is a must. So I believe the reason Jesus taught his disciples to pray so early in his ministry was because he wanted to teach them how to deal with anxiety. His first words, think about this, our Father, are an indicator that puts them in a place to help calm anxiety. Our Father. That's a word that should cause in our minds to help us realize we are not alone. And when you read on, he's not just a regular father. He's our heavenly father. That means he's got a vantage point. He's got a vantage point and power that no other person has. So I'm always amazed when I meet Christians who tell me that they don't talk to God. They don't want to talk to God. Paul says that we should pray unceasingly. Translation, all the time. All the time. So try this week. Converse with God all day and see what happens to your anxiety levels. When those trigger words or thoughts creep in your mind, take a deep breath and on the exhale, say something to God. It dawned on me as I thought about Paul's approach to dealing with anxiety that Paul practiced what he preached. He was a man who confessed that he had conflict from every direction, 
battles on the outside and fear on the inside. Being an apostle didn't inoculate him against anxiety. Just after he planted the church in Philippi, he was stripped, beaten, thrown into prison, and had his feet in stocks. If that's not an anxiety-producing moment, and I don't know what is. But guess what he was doing? If you read your Bibles, you'll see he was praying. He was praying. And when Paul had a nagging issue, if you remember, you know that issue that he referred to as a thorn in his side, a messenger from Satan? Guess what he did to deal with it? Pray. And I think I know where he learned it. If you read the Gospels, you'll see Jesus, God in the flesh, at various anxiety-producing moments, responding by praying. So just imagine the thought of being responsible for choosing 12 guys that will carry the torch of your ministry. It's no wonder Scripture tells us he prayed for how long? All night long. Just before the chief priest officers, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders came to take him away, guess what he was doing? Not panicking. I guess you could say he was panicking a bit. But he was praying. He was praying. This was Jesus' habit. So maybe, guess what? Maybe it should be our habit. Secondly, he says petition. It's a fancy way of saying asking. You approach God and at some point you ask Him for the things you need. I've learned that if you ask things that are in line with His will, He responds. Remember it was James who said in James 4 too, You have not, because why? Because you ask not. Yes, He knows all things and He knows what you need before you even ask Him. But his expectation for us is that we'd exhibit some faith and that we would ask him. His answer may not come when you want it, the way you want it. But after you look back in your rearview mirror, you will see that God heard and he responded in a way that was just right. So next time Mr. Anxiety comes knocking, don't panic. Instead, make a list of the things you need to overcome that feeling and ask God for His help. And lastly here, learn to bathe your approach, your approach and asking of God to do things for you in a spirit of thankfulness. Even before you start your time of prayer, be thinking of all the things you can be thankful for. Thanks for your grace. Thanks for allowing me to see another day, for giving me the privilege of prayer. You see, if you read Paul's writings, you'll see that he does this often. Even when he's in prison, he's expressing how thankful he is to various churches. What you do in prayer soon becomes your disposition in life. Instead of being wound up and cantankerous, you'll become a person that people love to be around because of your calming presence. See, I learned years ago in biochemistry that there was a word used to describe any of several enzymes that catalyze reactions that take place in our bodies. That name was ATPase. Just as we need ATPase biologically, we need it spiritually. If you're not one to remember verses, put the letters ATP in your minds. A, for approach God, T, for thank God, and P, for petition God. So next time anxiety comes knocking, think of ATP. Think of his promise in verse 7. It's really incredible. It's what Paul says is the byproduct of a life where ATP is practiced. I love it because he promises to give us what deep down we all desire. We desire the opposite of anxiety, don't we? We desire peace. We want peace like a river. We want to be like Jesus in the times when storms come rolling in. We want to be able to look at impending storms and say, Peace, 
be still. And for that to actually happen. So what happened with Jesus externally was a foretaste of what could happen internally with Christians. What this passage says is that internally, with God's help, we can have peace. He says we will experience a peace, and notice the adjective, that surpasses all comprehension. I've got that in bold in my notes, and I would say highlight that, circle it in your Bibles. A peace that surpasses all comprehension. There is a huge promise attached to practicing ATP. There is a reward for us learning practicing ATP. There is more to the promise. He says that peace will guard your heart and your mind as you live for Him. I promise you can say goodbye to divided minds and hello to a peaceful mind. Goodbye to sleepless nights. Goodbye to high blood pressure. Goodbye to everything that comes in Mr. Anxiety's backpack. That day I sang at the, na the, the National Anthem at the Gold Eyes game, I, I shifted my focus away from Mr. Anxiety. And, 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 and I shifted it to the wind that moved the flags atop the scoreboard. And seeing that wind caused me to think of the power that comes from God called the Holy Spirit. That power that carried the apostles along. The words Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 12.5 are true. He said, remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets. You know, I believe that God's peace must just be or might just be one of the most tangible evidences that there is a God who works in his people. When everyone else around us is flipping out, like the disciples were that night on the Sea of Galilee, you can be that calming example. God can do something in you that makes those in the world ask, how can you be such in such a peaceful state? And oh, what a wonderful opportunity that presents for you to share about the differences Jesus makes in your life. Us demonstrating this that surpasses this uh, peace that surpasses all comprehension is often the salt that makes the world thirst to know more about Jesus. We can let the world know, like the psalmist exclaimed in our reading today, that God is our refuge and strength, that He is always ready to help in our times of trouble. We, do, we, we don't have to fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into, into the sea. We can let them know the Lord of heaven's armies is here among us and that the God of Israel is our fortress. We can put the name, we can put a name to the source of peace that we have. So I asked Glenn to lead a song just before my sermon that is probably one of the most well-known hymns ever. Uh, sadly, the story behind the song isn't as well-known. Um, the song was written after a man lost his four girls in a tragic ship accident. They set sail and their father decided to stay back. He thought his girls would be safe on that vessel, but he received a call from his wife informing him of the horrible news. He boarded a ship from New York to meet up with his wife, and while they passed over the spot where the ship went down, the captain called out over the PA system saying, this is where the ship, or this is where the place was where the sh that ship went down. What could be more anxiety-raising than receiving that kind of news that your four girls had just been killed? It is said that after receiving the news, he penned the words to the song, It is well. He could have alternately wrote, I am at peace. I don't think he would have been able to handle the weight of this without that supernatural peace that only God provides. The peace came because he knew that there would come a day when the trump would resound and the Lord would descend to bring all those who have died in the Lord before him and all those still living in heaven. That thought calmed his anxieties, provided him with peace to go on in life. 
It's no wonder this hymn has been one that has comforted so many in stressful times. So maybe you're here for the first time this morning and you've never seen the passages we've been focused on. But I want you to know that God's desire for all of us is to move from the world into the Lord. His desire for you is that you'd get in His boat. His desire for people to be set free from the effects of Mr. Anxiety. That's His desire. God doesn't want you to go at life alone. His desire is to fill you up with His Spirit, for you to have a renewed mind, and to be totally dependent on Him and the strength He provides. And so if you desire to have God break the shackles that keep you in a state of spiritual slavery, I extend to you an invitation. Jesus and God, Jesus is God, says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Don't you want that? Is that not what you want deep down in your soul? So according to Acts 2.38, if you want God's Spirit, you must be baptized to receive it. With that Spirit, you get a lot of fruit. Including with, included within that fruit is a bundle of peace. And if you haven't done that yet, what holds you back? Would you come on down this morning and be clothed in Christ? In Christ, there is a peace that floods our souls. And oh, what life, what a life you can have when the Spirit of the Lord is in control. And maybe anxiety has got the best of you and you need someone to talk to or to pray with you. Won't you come forward this morning and see what a difference that step in your faith makes? Come now as we stand and sing this beautiful hymn that reminds us of the peace we can have through Jesus. Peace, my God,